and go live on my end. Sounds good. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Uh, I think we've got folks who are joining us from a variety of places today. Uh, we appreciate you all making some time to join us today. I'm Nav Kang. I'm a psychologist by training, chief clinical officer here at Brightview. I'm joined by Dr. Sean Ryan, our chief medical officer. Uh, we're excited to speak with you all today about treatment of patients with alcohol use disorder. So um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. We'll do, we'll do some introductions and, and we'll share the agenda with you all here in a second, but a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, for those who uh, are newer to, to some of our forums, if you can uh, make sure that you're on mute, please, so we can eliminate any uh, background noise, that would be great. Uh, for your knowledge, we are recording uh, this seminar and we're also live streaming it. Uh, some folks weren't able to join us who are interested in the content, and so we'll be sharing the recording with them. Again, it's also being live streamed on uh, on social media. And so if you would not like to be seen uh, in either of those cases, the recording or on the live stream, please feel free to turn your camera off. Uh, but we're, you're more than welcome to leave it on if you'd like. I just like to give people a heads up um, uh, that you know we are streaming and recording. Um, if you have questions throughout the talk today, please throw them into the chat. We'll have time for question and answer at the end, and we'll make sure that we go through any questions that we receive throughout. Um, sometimes we just answer the questions while we're talking as well, so please don't be shy about putting your questions in. We received several questions during the registration process, and uh, we will be uh, also ticking through those towards the end as well today. Uh, and last bit, uh, if you can uh, adjust your view setting so that you're focused on the speaker view, you'll be able to see uh, all of our content and uh, uh, myself or Dr. Ryan when we're speaking appropriately. So just use the view settings uh, in your uh, Zoom application there for that. So uh, again, appreciate you all making some time today uh, to join us. We'll speak for probably about 45 minutes and then have some question and answer uh, talking about the uh, treatment process and the recovery journey for patients uh, suffering from alcohol use disorder. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about the etiology of substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder in particular. We'll give you some, uh, some uh, of the framework around the Brightview treatment program. I'm very humbled by the fact that uh, several dozen people have made time to join us today. A great opportunity for connection. If you can put your name and your organization inside the chat uh, now in the next couple of minutes, that would be great. We'd love to be able to continue staying in contact with you and, and fostering an ongoing relationship uh, can be can be kickstarted by making sure that we just have your contact information. That'll also share with the other audience members just the diversity of folks who we have uh, joining us today. So uh, a couple of quick stats, like why are we talking about alcohol use disorder today? Um, I think many people appreciate longstanding problem in our society, but just a couple of quick stats as it pertains to alcohol use disorder, alcohol related deaths, that kind of thing in the pandemic era. So alcohol related deaths in the United States rose about 25% from 2019 to 2020. Uh, and uh, alcohol related deaths that includes like liver disease accidents, that kind of thing exceeded COVID-19 deaths in 2020 specifically among uh, adults younger than age 65. Uh, to give another frame, Total alcohol sales in the U.S. Uh, increased, just the volume of sales increased by 2.9% in 2020 over 2019. So that may not sound like a lot, but that's the largest annual increase in alcohol sales in the U.S. in the last 50 years. So something is happening now that is exacerbating an existing trend that I think many of us have observed. So critical for us to, to not forget, uh, as it were, about alcohol use disorder and the impacts uh, that it can have on, on a person, on their family. Uh, so critical that we're talking about this today and, and uh, grateful that so many of you have made some time to join us. If we go to the next slide, we'll do a couple of quick introductions on myself and Dr. Ryan. Uh, so again, I'm Nav Kang. I'm a psychologist by training. That means I'm a trained therapist. 
Uh, spent most of my career in the institutional healthcare setting. So worked in the emergency room, worked in inpatient psychiatry and medical surgical care, uh, also in primary care. And so uh, found, you know, we had patients with substance use disorder coming to our hospital-based services uh, many times, I think. Uh, and and the, the disappointing thing for me when I worked in uh, the hospital setting was that uh, we didn't really do a great job for people while they were in our care. Uh, and specifically when it came to alcohol use disorder, it was, it sometimes felt like it was ignored. The patient may be admitted for something else, they have pneumonia, they have some other condition, they're, they're hospitalized. And it's like the AUD is treated as a secondary condition. Maybe we don't attend to it as, as uh, thoughtfully as we do the primary uh, reason for admission. And so that underwhelming approach to care really caused me to become more curious about what we should be doing. Uh, and met Dr. Ryan along that journey and uh, eventually came here to Brightview where we were trying to lift up uh, essentially a continuum of care where one hasn't existed before in medicine. And that's the continuum of care for people with substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder being uh, one, of, one of the chief concerns that uh, uh, we oftentimes encounter. Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Dr. King. Um... Pleasure to meet everybody through this uh, Zoom uh, today. Again, I'm Dr. Sean Ryan. I'm a board-certified emergency and addiction physician. Um, also uh, compulsively educating myself along the way uh, my entire journey. I, I did my MBA during residency uh, and, and have since that time really walked the line of excellent medical practice where I trained at the University of Cincinnati uh, in the business of medicine and how to make sure that there's a sustainable uh, program for you know, any disease state that I work on and I, and I have worked on many. So I've, I've worked in the Medicaid space a lot. I do a lot of state and federal consulting in regards to different things. Uh, but probably about a decade ago, um, you know, like many folks lost friends and family, had colleagues going to rehab. It was just an overwhelming uh, wave of issues that, that forced me out of, uh, as Dr. Kang stated, institutional uh, medicine uh, into this space to try to figure out what was going on, what we weren't doing. And again, you know, working in Cincinnati, basically every day, I think I remember the, the very last day of my emergency medicine focused practice, uh, I saw like six or seven uh, overdose deaths in a matter of eight hours. And uh, just uh, most emergency physicians are the same. We, we don't tend to sit by and just watch things happen and, uh, and, and let and not ask questions about how we can do it better or fix things or help people. So Started Brightview that many years ago. Uh, we now reach across multiple states. I've been extraordinarily fortunate uh, to find folks like Dr. Kane to come along on this journey to elevate the standard of care in regards to substance use disorder, and particularly in this conversation, alcohol use disorder treatment. Uh, and we're excited to talk to you all today uh, about where we're at currently, uh, what can be done, kind of you know uh, about it, and, and potentially some future state treatments as we move the needle from you should just tell them to stop to evidence-based standards of care that deliver, you know, really solid outcomes in recovery. Next slide. We're gonna start uh, by talking about John. Um, John is an all too common case uh, that, that is, you know, lifetime prevalence of the disease state somewhere in the neighborhood of one in 10, which should sound like a lot. Uh, that is many, 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 many millions of Americans. And when you look around uh, thinking, you know, when you're in a public forum or in a group or even Thinking about how many participants we have on today, thinking about how many folks actually are John uh, is how my brain focuses on the issue uh, and knowing that most of these folks are not getting the treatments that they need um, and, are, and are kind of summarily uh, left behind by the treatment system we have in place uh, in, in the United States. So again, not at all uncommonly, John uh, might have been abused as a child, started experiment with alcohol as a teenager, by the way. Prevention is a whole other lecture, but you know, evidence-based prevention is a very important issue in preventing folks from starting this journey. So not having alcohol uh, end up in the hands of teenagers. College progression of alcohol use disorder. Uh, you know, I think folks are aware that um, alcohol use disorder or, or binge drinking is much more common in college uh, and that kind of time frame for folks than it used to be. And then continued and in this case, you know, to this point in the continuum, probably all you know, very little interventions. Maybe his friends just kind of like, hey, you shouldn't black out every Saturday. And that was kind of the end of it, which, of course, is not effective. Um, you know, after John uh, got his first time job, you know, decreased because of focus and, and maturity and such and so on. Uh, but because John had this history uh, of both kind of use as well as what it had done to his brain, it's not uncommon to see 
drinking uh, heavily dependent on current stressors of, of, the, of someone's life. And, and very, very uh, many folks do this. It's fairly easy to get a you know a DUI if your alcohol habits um, are not uh, you know uh, within reason, uh, which is a different conversation. Uh, but that often uh, ends up ends you know people up in the legal system and they get referred to programs which are very rarely evidence based treatment systems. Uh, in fact, most legal referrals are not to an evidence based program. Uh, but the old um, standard of kind of rinse and repeat, or if you send somebody to rehab, they're all better, which has a 90 plus percent failure, failed John in this situation. And then uh, of course, more stressors uh, when he lost his basic support structure of his fiance. Got a second DUI, not uncommon, and then referred to another program by a judge. Again, unfortunately, most of these program referrals from the legal system don't land at a place like Brightview, don't land in an ongoing treatment support system, biopsychosocial program, but end up in different places. And especially uh, as a point for those that are professionally licensed, a lot of states have different rules on who has to go where, what, when, uh, which of course is not at all how we treat the rest of diseases in medicine uh, in regards to, um, you know, a kind of a referral pathway. So summary, very common, not optimal at all. And John has had a lot of opportunities for intervention. Earlier is better, no surprise, that he could have gotten this under control. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means. Next slide, please. Probably the most important slide uh, in the whole deck. And the reason I say that, we talk about stigma uh, against folks with substance use disorder or substance abuse as the old term, as being one of the, if not the primary barrier to folks getting into treatment and then staying in treatment, getting good treatment, et cetera. And that's a long conversation but it is present, it's pervasive, it's in every part of the work that I do, it's day-to-day -day with patients and their families, it's in the public forum, it's in rules and laws, it is in reimbursement for services if somebody needs to get you know, uh, substance use disorder treatment. The stigma is pervasive, and the fact of the matter is, I think it's multifactorial, but one of the big things is most folks think this is a moral failing. They do not understand that there is scientific proof that that is not the case. They do not understand that these three factors lead to most folks with substance use disorder have little to nothing to do with their quote decisions in life. Primarily genetics. When none of us chose to be born this way, there's a few weird cases of different genetic modification occurring on planet earth. We're not gonna go down that rabbit hole, but by and large, Dr. Kang and myself were born because we were born and we didn't get to choose a single gene that we were dealt. And 50% of the issues related to substance use disorder are in that genetic framework. Half of it already gone out of the decision making, right? You didn't get to choose. Environmental factors. As we stated, John was abused at home as a kid. Way too many folks, you know, psychologically, sexually, et cetera, physically, whatever. Way too many folks had adverse childhood experiences. And the evidence is very clear that this is a substantial contributor to addiction, substance use disorder. So... I can positively say I have never yet done a patient's assessment and discussed their childhood adverse experiences or trauma and thought that they had a choice in the way they were abused as a 10 year old. That is not a thing. So genetics, no choice. Environmental factors, very little choice, if any. And then other things that are around them. And we even talk about choices on peer influences. Not exactly. You grew up in the neighborhood you grew up and if you were 10, it's not like you were contributing to the family decision-making on what apartment you were living in, really, rarely. And so there's a lot of issues in environmental factors, but by and large, none of them choice. And then exposure. We talk about this one a lot for opioids, but it really does also, uh, you know, it is relevant to alcohol use disorder. By and large, early exposure is not necessarily a person's choice. Now there are choices made and there are choices made along the journey to substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder. But please understand that it was in this framework, this is a minor factor in relation to the other two. And by and large, folks don't actually choose their first exposure to most drugs, particularly opioids, which we're not focusing on today. But if all of the um, factors are present of the environmental exposure, et cetera, you know, why is there alcohol around? Why is it even a common thing, whatnot? Uh, you can understand how very few choices are made in these three general categories for folks who have substance use disorder. It's just not a choice. 
Um, that, that has that's probably the number one point we can make today to help folks. I'm not sure of the mix of individuals on this uh, participant list today, but for the public to understand, this is not a moral failing or a choice, and we should not treat it as such. Next slide, please. These are all things, and I'm not going to read them to this um, this group. These are the signs and symptoms of alcohol use disorder. These are, I would say, kind of the succinct or paraphrased versions of DSM-5 uh, psychiatric diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder or, or other substance use disorders. They're all the same. And we use them for diagnostic purposes. But in reality, I think anyone can read these, and I think they're well summarized and paraphrased, and say, oh, I understand. Yeah, if someone continues drinking despite their mental or physical health concerns, that's a problem. If you spend an inordinate amount of time drinking or hungover, that's a problem. If you crave alcohol, I mean, these are just really that simple. In fact, after many years of using these diagnostic criteria, I really do feel like they're still pretty amazingly accurate. If you're doing these things, whoever you is, it's probably a problem, probably uh, a sign or a symptom of alcohol use disorder and something that both the individual would like to address most likely, right? No one really wakes up and thinks I would love to neglect my children today. Uh, that's not a thing, right? That's where we go back to people thinking this is a choice. I would love not to perform at work like I am supposed to. I really can't wait to have alcohol withdrawal symptoms, which are terrible. None of this stuff is a choice. And I think these, these, uh, these terms, these um, definitions here really should ring true to anybody who's trying to figure out whether alcohol use disorder is an issue or not for them. And I think we have a lot of opportunity in the public to educate folks on when they should seek help earlier, because that's better than waiting until their first DUI. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn this over to Dr. King for the next few slides and talk to you in a minute. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Um, really quick, Norma Henderson, you'll have to tell us if you're, when, when you say you're in Scotland, if you're actually in like if you're part of our international audience today. Uh, but I, she has a question, is there more information on ACEs? Yes, we can send through some links on some seminal studies uh, as it pertains to ACEs, uh, some great resources out there uh, that, can, that can help inform, uh, uh, I think whatever questions you might have as it pertains to you know, ACEs and eventual diagno diagnosis with a you know, trauma disorder or with potential substance use disorder, that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> so if you've shared your contact information with us, we'll be able to do that. Uh, so hidden symptoms of alcohol use disorder, I think to Dr. Ryan's point, some, some of the things on the prior slide are outwardly observable, and there are many clinicians on the line today who are trained to evaluate uh, physiological symptoms of alcohol use disorder or alcohol withdrawal in particular. Um, there are others who are trained to evaluate the psychosocial uh, symptoms or, or ramifications of uh, an alcohol use disorder. But we oftentimes get this kind of question from uh, lay persons as well, like, hey, how do you tell if someone is struggling with alcohol use? Or, hey, I have, I have a concern about a loved one or a friend, but I'm not sure like, what I'm even looking at kind of thing. What should I do? You know, there's a sense that a sense of responsibility that I should do something if I have a, uh, you know, if I have a sense that something's wrong. And so broadly, what I, what I tend to tell folks is that if you're seeing a change in functioning, then that could be a red flag that warrants a further uh, evaluation. And, and when I say evaluation, I mean by a professional, right? And so, uh, and, and there's there's a little bit of a rabbit hole we can get into there in terms of you know whether someone's willing to go acknowledge that they have a problem or it should be looked at more more uh, distinctly or whatever. But yeah, even as a as a precursor to that, we tend to see changes in folks' behavior, whether it's in their mood, in their relationships or in their day-to-day -day functioning uh, that, that come from the, uh, the use of the substance. Now, for some period of time, some people can remain functional or they can hide it, uh, or they can uh, uh, plan their use to coincide with times where uh, others may not be able to observe the impacts. Uh, and so uh, part of that can be characterized as one of the symptoms of thinking about planning you know, when, when am I going to get to drink next or that kind of thing. Uh, the mental bandwidth that is consumed by the substance use disorder is one that, yes, very difficult to outwardly assess or observe, but is internally 
something that becomes more and more consuming for the person. Uh, so yes, you may see that someone is, is functioning well on the outside, but then when that starts to degrade, you have uh, the observation that they're not meeting their obligations, not meeting their responsibilities, that kind of thing. Uh, or if you see changes in mood, behavior, irritability, whatever it might be. Uh, yes, th those are, are more overt signs that uh, you know, that someone is, is developing a, a substance use disorder or has already developed an alcohol use disorder and that kind of thing. Screening, as Dr. Ryan alluded to earlier, is so essential for a variety of intersectional reasons with what I'm describing. Because until those signs are outwardly observable, and, you know, another party can't, can't necessarily know that an intervention is necessary or a further evaluation or assessment could be helpful uh, and instead, it's much more incumbent on the person themselves to have some sense of, uh, of reflection or, or acknowledgement that like, hey, something's not going the way that I want it to. Like, uh, like Dr. Ryan alluded to earlier, hey, I'm not, I'm not producing as much at work as I used to be, or I'm missing deadlines or that kind of thing, right? A legal charge that comes with, you know, a penalty or a court appearance or something like that. Like those are overtly observable, hard to refute things that actually happen. Whereas if someone is starting to slip or starting to become less productive, they're not uh, paying attention when they're observing their kid's game or they're skipping the game altogether because they're going to go drink instead or whatever. Like those things are less overtly observable, easier to not notice. And typically the person is the one who's going to notice those things first. So early screening, early brief intervention, a discussion on the quality of life and on uh, priorities and, and what are the, the things that, that motivate a person and, and that they want to be engaged with in their life. If those things are becoming compromised by alcohol use, uh, that can be uh, a great way screening then, and then the, the follow-up brief intervention and potential referral to treatment, the entire expert protocol, as many folks are aware of, can be a great way to, 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 um, uh, shed some light on and, and get some attention for, uh, a, a set of problems before it becomes a diagnosable disorder. Uh, so when it's still at the, you know, quote unquote, hidden stage where the, the person is still functional, doesn't meet diagnostic criteria yet and that kind of thing. And then again, when someone does meet diagnostic criteria, uh, they may be functioning well, but again, by, by that point, typically you're, you're having some outward observable signs as well. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about diagnosing uh, and setting up a treatment program, which we'll talk about later. We actually follow the same lens, uh, the same biopsychosocial framework that Dr. Ryan described earlier, that biopsychosocial framework. Uh, we want to evaluate uh, patient status uh, and their needs through that same kind of lens. Uh, a formal uh, a set of criteria like the ASAM criteria can also be uh, highly effective, obviously, then at, uh, at assessing uh, all of those needs in the same way. But basically what we like to do is take that biopsychosocial framework and create that as a through line for all of, uh, uh, for all of treatment, for our understanding of the disease, and then also for the eventual outcomes that we want to help our patients generate. And so when we think about uh, you know, genetics as a risk or as part of the risk and protective factor profile, obviously we're not changing someone's genetics uh, yet, right? Uh, and so that's not part of our medical intervention set, but there's a physiological component of having an alcohol use disorder, whether it's alcohol withdrawal or something else. And so when we think about our intervention set, yes, there has to be a medical intervention for that. And from an outcome standpoint, is the patient biologically stable, right? Uh, and the same thing as it pertains to the patient's psychosocial needs. So uh, is, is there uh, depression and anxiety being attended to? Do they have coping skills to deal with cravings and triggers and other stressors in their life? Do they have an adequate recovery environment or, or living situation? So uh, we, we, at Brightview, we use the ASAM criteria for a variety of reasons. Dr. Ryan and I do some work with ASAM and, and have been fortunate to be able to contribute in that level, but not, not just because we have some relationship with ASAM, but because uh, it is the gold standard in, uh, uh, in, evaluating, in, in evaluating both level of care need and then also fostering uh, a sensible approach to treatment planning. And as a result, it's been adopted by regulators and payers and, and uh, other stakeholders across the country to help uh, understand uh, how sick is someone, right? Like if it's a medical emergency, if there's a biomedical issue that's going on, very difficult to attend to other things if there's that active emergency and that certainly needs to be attended to and, and broadly influences initial level of care or placement as some people call it. And so for us, 
we look at the uh, at the biopsychosocial framework, the ASAM criteria. We say, okay, how do we assess this patient's total set of needs? What's most urgent right now? What's most primary? That informs our initial interventions and then our medium and long-term work with the patient as well. That informs the structure of the treatment plan and the treatment program that the patient is going to be participating in. And again, then we want to evaluate uh, how, how stable uh, do, do each of those elements become over time in the first three months, six months, the first year in treatment, that kind of thing at the individual level. So if we think about uh, the, the overall assessment, uh, what we've built into uh, our treatment system is uh, both a medical evaluation and clinical evaluation uh, and a social service evaluation that ensures that, that we're meeting the patient's needs right out of the gate. Uh, I'll take a pause there and throw it back to, uh, to Dr. Ryan uh, to take a look at the next slide. Is that okay? So as we all know, uh, or as most of us might, you know, alcohol withdrawal uh, is a real thing. And as folks build up tolerance to alcohol over time, uh, and it can be fairly rapid, but it tends to be one of the slower and reverse of other drugs like opioids. As we build up tolerance over time, it does have a lot of physiological damage uh, that's done from long-term alcohol use. And that can be, again, kind of moderate to you know, regular to moderate alcohol use still has damage that's done to, to the physiology. But with alcohol use disorder uh, of any type, you know, generally the tolerance creeps up and we, when, when alcohol is removed or excluded for whatever reason, including going to jail uh, for a period of time, very significant withdrawal can occur and uh, one of the most life-threatening types in regards to what it does to the human body, which, which is actually pretty complicated and why it's important that medical professionals are trained on alcohol withdrawal management that doesn't include just giving them benzodiazepines such as Ativan. Um, it's also why uh, sending someone to a, an absence-based rehabilitation program without medical oversight uh, for alcohol use disorder is a real problem um, because uh, the person, not only if they begin to have these withdrawal symptoms, are they likely to leave that program because they feel so terrible uh, if they're available, if they can leave. But, uh, but the fact is, you know, if those programs aren't medically capable of dealing with these consequences, it can mean fatal fatalities um, for the patients, which does happen. I will say, uh, even in 2022, I am still working to educate a lot of my emergency medicine colleagues uh, who are generally better trained on these issues uh, as to how to assess and manage them. And historically and still today, often what uh, is described as treatment planning for these folks is if they're not actively having seizures or their heart rate isn't completely out of control, then I'm just going to send them home and you know tell them to go get help. Again, absolutely the wrong way to go about it. Uh, it's not even medically, uh, medically legally uh, defensible. Um, so it is. we have a long way to go on the general topics of substance use disorder education in the med in medical field. But particularly for alcohol use disorder, we still have a long way to go in folks understanding how dangerous this actually can be. Um, and so, uh, you know, this can be managed as an inpatient or outpatient, but it takes trained individuals uh, to make that assessment. And there are things like up to date, which have five criteria and other um, screening uh, and thought processes that, that can help folks to determine what is the right setting for alcohol withdrawal to be managed uh, it, for, for uh, these patients. Again, millions of patients per year hitting the medical system, I would say probably 80 to 90% of the time being mismanaged. Um, and, and most importantly, being mismanaged in the long term. So whether they, act, they don't have seizures and die because they had some measure of management with medicines, uh, is only one part of the story. And unfortunately, is actually not particularly important as long as there's not a fatality because if they don't get linked into treatment assessed appropriately as Dr. Kang has, and we'll talk about again, uh, and then put into an ongoing effective evidence-based program, including medical intervention. You know, this is just becomes a cycle. And to be very honest, uh, I still remember clearly, and Dr. Kang knows the story of being an intern and seeing a guy doing this cycle of withdrawal and emergency department visit and ejected from the emergency department or inpatient for a minute, and then he'd come right back. Um, and when I asked the mental health uh, professionals on site, uh, psychiatry department, the response was terrible. You know, uh, it was basically if you tell him to stop, if you get him to stop drinking, I'll help him with his bipolar disorder, which of course is not a thing. That's not a treatment plan by any stretch. So it's important that folks are trained on this. It's important to know that they know how dangerous it is in any setting, 
hospital, jail, rehabilitation center, whatever, uh, and that folks are really well um, educated again on how to do this well, how to initiate good treatment to help that patient manage their acute situation, keep them safe, and make them feel better and also feel valued so that when they go to treatment afterwards, which they have to do, that there are folks there that are well-educated and can keep them in treatment so the recovery is possible. Next slide, please. We do talk about detoxification as an old term. The reason I don't particularly like it is because it does lend itself towards that rinse and repeat kind of rehab that doesn't work. Um, if we just, you know, if we just detox somebody and get them to talk to somebody afterwards, they'll be fine. No, they will not. Uh, withdrawal management. And, and by the way, there are absolutely um, published uh, articles about ongoing withdrawal happening over weeks, right? So not just I lowered their heart rate with added in in the hospital and therefore that I detoxified them. That's not at all it. They're also in thinking through the medical complications and the physiological issues related to withdrawal management, the body damage that's been done across time. What does that mean? Like, what is that? How can I help with those things uh, as a physician or medical provider in the acute, but also subacute phases of things to help those patients stay in treatment? Because if I help their withdrawal management for three days and they go on and have protracted withdrawal at a more minor state in the weeks to come, they're not going to stay in treatment most likely. Um, so it is really important that folks are better educated on withdrawal management. And I will say um, some of the ICU docs and other folks that I have worked with are pretty capable at that acute phase, but not thinking about anything post-acute at all in regards to how to help them stay uh, stable for a while. Also, the co-assessment, uh, which I know Dr. King has touched on, we'll touch on again, uh, of their other mental health conditions and why they might be drinking. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the least medications possible for the most effect. So is their primary reason for being, um, abusing alcohol, terrifying anxiety? And if so, how do you manage that in the acute subacute and ongoing phases of treatment? And so the, the, um, withdrawal management, you know, is, is pretty, pretty complicated, but we can, we can teach our team members across the continuum, which we'll talk about how to do their part of it. I don't really actually need the ICU doc to do an anxiety assessment and make sure that that's being addressed five to 50 days later, but they do need to know how to do, like they have to know when to admit the patient, which is often not the case and what to do uh, to support them through the transition and provide that, that supportive care. Um, symptom monitoring is important in regards to, again, acute, subacute and ongoing uh, meaning. Uh, if you send somebody home, uh, and don't recognize they're at a high risk for delirium tremens, the, you know, the most um, extreme version of, of alcohol withdrawal, uh, you can't monitor them, right? So you know, we, we, symptom monitoring, it has a, a lot of uh, meanings, uh, but it does, man, man, it, it does manifest itself uh, in relapse when it is not a planned activity in all the phases uh, of treatment. I want to say very clearly, Medications are not nearly used enough for alcohol use disorder in the entirety of the continuum. So the fact that Vivitrol, long-acting naltrexone, has fairly substantial evidence in heavy drinking reduction, and I'm going to talk about what that means in just a second, but it is very rarely used uh, in many settings. In fact, tomorrow I'm traveling to give a lecture to al about alcohol use disorder uh, to a primary care group uh, of folks. It is very rarely used and it is very rarely even suggested uh, that there are medications that can help people to reduce their heavy drinking. And in fact, in conjunction with other medications, including things people aren't commonly aware of like Zofran or gabapentin, you can have up to, if not beyond, north of 75% reduction in drinking. And I do wanna make that point. I think most often alcohol use disorder and other use disorders are addressed as binary. They're doing it or they're not. Well, that is not reality. It's not reality for any disease state. Do we all hope that our diabetics would take every medication on time every day, reduce their, you know, completely avoid uh, foods that are bad for them and exercise five days a week? Absolutely. What's the percentage of time that all three of those things happen? 15? I don't know. It's not 80%. I'll tell you that. Uh, and so I think it's important that folks understand these medications are intended to assist and potentially hope that folks uh, can reduce if not eliminate their drinking. But that is not a realistic goal. 
We shouldn't expect that of the patient and we shouldn't expect that of the medications either. That being said, again, to reiterate, these medications when used appropriately can be highly effective in helping somebody get to recovery and finding the right level of use of whatever uh, chemical we're talking about, which doesn't necessarily apply to, to uh, high potency opioids for different reasons we won't go down through, but definitely applies here for alcohol. It's a pervasive chemical in our society and it needs to be managed as a chronic ongoing exposure uh, as opposed to a binary thought process. Dr. King. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. There's a question in the chat I think you might want to take uh, as well. So, I, I mean, to, to this whole conversation, it wasn't even that many years ago, I'm thinking three, four years ago, that standard of care at one of the hospitals I worked at was uh, for, for patients with alcohol use disorder, discharge plan involved a referral to AA only. Now, uh, we look at AA and, and other uh, you know, supportive uh, services like that as, as great adjuncts to core treatment, but we don't look at them as core treatment. And in that entire physician group's mindset, medication never factored into the picture at all for the, for the patient's long-term care plan. Uh, the, the reason for the discussion at the time was we should be using a comprehensive set of interventions while the patient's in the hospital, but, uh, it came to light that, Hey, after the patient leaves, it's not part of the typical care plan either question in the chat are the benzodiazepines given during just withdrawal or through the whole rehabilitation. I mean, you generally touched on the topic, but I don't know if you want to address the, the narrower scope of that question. Sure. Of course, the answer, the answer is it depends. Uh, right. So, uh, is the patient, what is the primary premise for the patient's alcohol use disorder in regards to their anxiety and depression? And maybe uh, low dose, long acting benzodiazepines are a decent and reasonable medication in the short to medium term, maybe even long term, depending on their, their impetus. Um, the answer to your question is generally yes. We do not intend for folks to stay on benzodiazepines very long, but it's not two days, it's not three days, it can be days, two weeks. Um, as a side note, benzodiazepine use disorder or, or sedative hypnotic disorder is a huge problem in our country, uh, and way too many folks are addicted uh, to that class of medications, and, and those types of withdrawal management and ongoing treatment are actually quite complicated, should be managed by, by a comprehensive program. And so we don't want to lead our patients down that path, which is already a problem for many people, um, and, and generally, no, we don't intend to do it for more than acute to subacute. Uh, but folks have to be open to understanding when that may be the, the right thing to do uh, and using it as a tool uh, in the toolbox when the good comprehensive assessment indicates it as such. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Uh, so what you all see on the screen here is a basic depiction of a, continu of a continuum of care for, for people with sub substance use disorder. And so uh, as I alluded to earlier, what we are endeavoring to do through close collaboration with hospital partners, our former colleagues, our growing network, uh, we have forthcoming discussions with some partners in Virginia uh, across the state, frankly, uh, as an example, where we continue to do this continuum building. Uh, you know, all of that is critically important when people need a higher level of care, as Dr. Ryan has, has referenced a couple of times. Uh, if, if a patient is in a higher level of care need for alcohol use disorder, uh, it could be a life-threatening situation. And if not attended to properly, that, you know, that is something that causes people to die. Uh, that being said, broadly, uh, only a minority of patients need inpatient care at any given time. And the way that we look at uh, substance use disorder as a chronic relapsing medical condition, uh, it means that uh, everyone is going to need outpatient care at some point. Uh, if you think about it, chronic disease management doesn't typically happen in an acute care setting. That, that acute care setting, emergency room, hospital, uh, that, that's where uh, an acute exacerbation is, uh, is addressed or that type of intervention is offered. So yes, if a patient has you know, high potential uh, for, for withdrawal or they're acutely intoxicated with a history of complicated alcohol withdrawal, if they have other medical conditions that could be uh, you know, could, could have some uh, complex interaction with the underlying alcohol use disorder or with the intoxication or withdrawal. Yes, if the patient has, uh, you know, severe uh, mental illness uh, or, again, exacerbation of, uh, of you know, depression or, or potential to harm themselves or others. Yes, those psychiatric needs need to be managed uh, acutely as well. But ultimately, patient needs ongoing uh, support, ongoing treatment that's convenient, that's accessible, that's available close to home, that is 
in network with their insurance that fits into their daily lives, right? Folks should be able to go to work, take care of their kids and engage in treatment for their substance use disorder the same way that they do uh, with any other chronic disease. And so when we think about uh, the continuum of care, where does Brightview fall? We don't have any beds. People ask us if we operate inpatient or residential services. We may one day, we, we've actually done quite a bit of discussion and deliberation over the last year or so now about offering higher levels of care. But what we understand is that uh, the uh, addiction crisis that our communities face continues to escalate, as I referenced earlier. Uh, many times the opioid epidemic is what hits the news. And unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, escalating problem as it relates to alcohol continues to fly under the radar. And so what we understand is we have to act with a sense of urgency, bring comprehensive high quality treatment to as many people as possible. And frankly, the fastest way to do that to meet the broadest need that you possibly can is through an investment in, in outpatient and intensive outpatient services. But for someone who's not uh, aware, uh, what IOP generally characterizes is a, a very high dose counseling intervention at the uh, initial stages of treatment. So anywhere from one to three months uh, of very high intensity group therapy where a patient is, is uh, spending eight to 12 hours in group therapy per week uh, for that, that uh, you know, four to 12 week period. It's, it's a great way to jumpstart treatment with a high dose of counseling. But again, that, that is a time limited phase typically in treatment and the patient then uh, is, is engaging in a more uh, routine, uh, you know, weekly, biweekly, monthly kind of outpatient care which again, fits into their life, ensures that they can meet their other responsibilities uh, as, they, as they proceed through the recovery process. So that, that's where Brightview sits. But again, we work very closely with, with other providers on building out this continuum using existing infrastructure, using existing medical and nursing staff, providing education, as Dr. Ryan said, going to train uh, fellow physicians just tomorrow on, uh, on a variety of topics related to, to what we're talking about today. Next slide, please. I talked a, a fair bit about uh, the medical practices related to alcohol use disorder management in every phase, uh, but I'm just going to reiterate, um, you know, that many reports, decades of evidence have shown that good medical intervention, including medications, successfully reduces the issues that we all care about for folks that have these, these problems. So substance use, risk of relapse, associated criminal behavior, all these things, and helping the patients return to a healthy functional life. That was very clearly called out in the Surgeon General's report of 2016 on um, drugs and alcohol use. Uh, and still today, so you know, we're seven years, six years later uh, from that report, uh, and we have folks somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%. You know, it's a little bit hard to nail it down, but definitely not 70% of folks getting good evidence based treatment, including medical interventions, as a part of a biopsychosocial plan. The medications I covered a little bit ago um, in regards to naltrexone and, and others. Uh, also amazing news is there's other medications coming. There's even other treatments which are interesting, um, neurointerventions, which could be including magnetic stimulation of the brain or other electrical stimulations of certain nerves. So this is by definition neuroscience. Um, it never has been some sort of hokey, like, you know, tell them to stop and it'll be better as long as they find, you know, their pathway through spiritual. I mean, those are all parts of a journey of recovery. And to Dr. Kang's point, I always say it's an and, not an or. We should all be working together. I am not a member of any of the social network support systems uh, as I've never entered treatment nor needed such things. However, absolutely should be uh, interacting with our partners in all parts of the space to, to make sure that folk, the folks find their journey to recovery and whatever that means. But the core treatment has to be the medical biopsychological, biopsychosocial excuse me, biopsychosocial, including medical uh, interventions to really give that patient the best chance of recovery. And we shouldn't accept the five to 10% success rate, which is reality uh, when we don't include uh, a professional treatment plan uh, as, as part of it. Now, do some folks find, you know, they just put the bottle down and that's the end of the day? Sure, those stories exist. But as a professional, as a clinician, uh, as a scientist, that's not how we can and should address this issue. And we should know the most about what we currently have available and be excited about the fact that there are other interventions coming down the pipe uh, that can increase the, the, the rate of success for recovery. Dr. King. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. I, and I think the, the broad data would support what Dr. Ryan just said, right? That yes, there, there are 
uh, anecdotal cases of spontaneous remission, as it were, but there's also tens of thousands of Americans who are dying every year of alcohol use disorder and alcohol-related causes. Uh, and that continues to occur. So if it were just so easy to you know, put down the proverbial bottle, um, then people would probably be doing that in greater order. Uh, but what we see is that more people are dying of this substance use disorder uh, year over year. And so uh, that uh, antiquated method may not, may not work or that singular method of, of relying on uh, spontaneous remission to hopefully happen uh, may, not, may not be the only uh, strategy that we want to you know, rest our hopes on. And so uh, what we're talking about here is a, uh, obviously more comprehensive uh, translation of science to practice. So, you know, when we think about what we're talking about, then, you know, this, this is not a, it's not a typical doctor's office setting. It's not a typical therapist's office setting. It's a quite complicated, multidisciplinary, integrated medical practice that we're talking about operationalizing if a patient's full needs are really going to be met, right? We're working with folks at that initial stage of treatment to understand their motivation for treatment, to enhance that existing motivation, their readiness to change, Right? What is the potential that they could relapse? What, what does their recovery environment look like? Do they even have a recovery environment? Right? Like we're asking patients on the first day if they have a safe place to go and a way to get back to us the next day. Uh, do they have enough food to eat and that kind of thing? And so many times when folks seek out specialty uh, SUD treatment, the way that we offer it at Brightview, the disease state has gotten to a, a rather progressive point. Uh, although I think over the last couple of years, we've been uh, I, I've been somewhat heartened by the fact that we, we have been able to access patients earlier in the disease process, still diagnosable, obviously, but uh, it hasn't gotten to that point necessarily. But, you know, in order for us to lift up this comprehensive biopsychosocial model, we have to be very intentional about having well-staffed, well-trained medical team, as Dr. Ryan alluded to. And then similarly, our, our uh, clinical team, the therapists, the social workers, the case management team, the peer recovery specialists, that needs to be a comprehensive team. And all of those folks need to work together in a very integrated way. Our, our nursing team is Washington, leave it on. Quite, quite uh, critical, uh, especially as we're uh, uh, assessing and intervening as it pertains to withdrawal uh, and withdrawal potential and that kind of thing. So, you know, for us at Brightview, we understand, yes, very complex model of care to operationalize, very complex, uh, you know, daily operation to, to actually run. Uh, however, uh, that complexity is simply reflective of an understanding of how complex the underlying disease state is, right? And so when, when our teams go to work every day and consistently deliver on this model every day, uh, you know, we, we ask a lot of them, uh, but that's ultimately because we, uh, I think we have a good understanding of, of the nature of what we're dealing with and, and what the patient is going to need if we're, if we're truly going to uh, have treatment work for them, if it's going to deliver value for them uh, and, and for the community at large. Dr. Ryan, I think I'll throw it back to you. Uh, we'll, we'll revisit John and then uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about outcomes. We do want to share a little bit about uh, uh, the actual data that we collect. Sure. Uh, you know, I, wanted to, I want people to think about this uh, journey with John is uh, most importantly is, you know, treatment works. Um, I think that actually has been assessed in public and professional settings through surveys, especially a lot of physicians don't think treatment works. They think it's just an inevitability that, the, that John is going to end up uh, you know, with liver failure and or and or in jail or whatever. So, and that's just not true. It doesn't have to be true. Um, so, after his second refer, you know, DUI, John was referred to local outpatient care, which basically, you know, he was seen that day or this or the next day, whenever it was right for John. At Brightview, that's how we do it. It's always been that way. It always will be that way, as far as I can uh, keep uh, adherence to our primary mission and vision. And so, um, that is unique, though. Uh, you know, the fact that we'll see somebody uh, same day, next day is something that we're very proud of at Brightview because we're trying to address John when he's ready or when he has to be ready in this case, uh, because of the, of the judge's uh, mandate. Uh, the, the patient, you know, the, the whole team uh, does things to help pay, uh, John really reorient his whole biopsychosocial um, core, uh, including medications and therapies and other interventions and get John back on the right course, which is where everybody want to see. And, and a lot of folks, you know, I will say a lot of folks uh, are able to repair their relationship with their friends, family, kids, et cetera. And that can be any more rewarding to our team when we see this journey, uh, you know, summary uh, and knowing that these things do happen. It does work. Uh, and that's a 
you know, probably the other most important point to portray other than uh, addiction is not a choice is we can treat it uh, and people can get better uh, and they can do better just like other forms of diseases or other therapy interventions for other issues. Dr. King. Uh, I got a question here from Creed on, uh, on harm reduction, which I, I didn't touch on. It was on the slide there. So, so what does harm reduction mean? I mean? Outside in the world, we think about harm reduction, let's say for opioid use disorder, syringe exchange, Narcan distribution, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, of I think, well-supported interventions that can happen at a community level or, or via public health channels, that kind of thing. But inside of Brightview, we operate with a harm reductionist uh, clinical philosophy. Uh, said a different way, we're, we're non-punitive in our approach to our patients. Creed's question is, for clients involved in the justice system, uh, how does Brightview utilize harm reduction techniques if deemed uh, clinically necessary? So, you know, for us, when I say non-punitive, I simply mean we don't fire patients from treatment for struggling with the condition for which they're seeking our help. Uh, and so we believe that approach to treatment is always clinically necessary, right? <laughs> that we want to treat patients with dignity and respect and frankly, with a measure of grace, uh, which is Dr. Ryan, I think has said a few times in today's discussion is how we operate in every other area of healthcare, right? We both used to work in the emergency room. I mean, how many times do you have a patient who was brought in uh, via EMS or, you know, family member brought them in seeking treatment for COPD exacerbation who's smoking a cigarette like outside? <laughs> I mean, it happens every day, right? And, and the irony that we treat patients well in that space, and that's what we expect, that's a substance use disorder. So we're so close yet so far with other use disorders when we think about alcohol, and certainly when we think about stimulants and opioids. So, you know, for us, uh, you know, it can be uh, a little bit of a rub in the justice system when the patient is, you know, required to go to, to treatment, uh, yet there is some measure of instability that is observed by the treatment program. Uh, judges will ask us, uh, you know, should I put this person in jail for the weekend? Is that going to set them right? And that kind of thing. But I think what we have found is that uh, I, first, I value the questions that appreciate the fact that we get the questions now then versus before when we didn't get the questions and the patient would disappear. And it's like, oh, John went to jail over the weekend because of A, B, and C. So I, I think that uh, the justice system has certainly become increasingly open-minded about treatment, about the conceptualization of substance use disorders is chronic relapsing, oftentimes lethal medical conditions. The engagement with the, the healthcare system, us uh, as treatment providers, I think has, has improved greatly. Uh, but I think, you know, broadly, create your question, we, we utilize a harm reductionist philosophy with all of our patients. Undergirding that is just the idea of safety. If the patient is safer today than they were yesterday, if they are safer in treatment than not being in treatment, if they are stable, more stable than they were before, even though all of these terms are somewhat relative to what that patient's prior status or what their history might have been. I think that's the way that we play the long game with people uh, to ensure that we actually start to dig out of, out of the collective mess that we're in. So does it take addiction treatment work? As Dr. Ryan said, I, I think that there is uh, you know, a body of, of research that is slowly being produced that does start to answer that question affirmatively. Yes, addiction treatment works. We, we looked at our own patients, over 12,000 patient journeys uh, over our almost three-year time period. The paper uh, that outlines much more data around this is available on our website, brightviewhealth.com slash research uh, for anyone who's interested to look at it. But what we find is that if we stand up a treatment program using that biopsychosocial framework and evaluate outcomes through the same lens, Yes, patients' lives transform in every way that we can measure. So less depressed, less anxious, sleeping better at night, using the hospital emergency room and inpatient space less for medical, psychological, psychiatric, substance use disorder reasons, getting a job, sometimes for the first time ever, uh, getting off probation, getting their kids back. Uh, all of these things are great. And of course, people are using substances less, many times achieving complete abstinence in, in 90 days. But again, as Dr. Ryan said, not necessarily an immediate goal for everyone. And it's important for us to, to work with patients on uh, the relative goals that they have and, and build from there. Uh, Anne sent me a direct question here uh, about how we're a drinking culture. It's a good observation, right? It's acceptable and promoted and questioned when and if you don't drink, right? And so she's wondering, what are your thoughts on advertising and the way that drinking is promoted in our society? And what, if anything, can we do about it? We're going to see more of this as it pertains to marijuana. Many states already encounter a challenge associated with this. So I, I think it's less about whether something is legal or illegal uh, or condoned socially or not. I think it ultimately comes back to 
what are the ramifications? What are the costs that uh, the, the opportunity costs associated with the use? What what else is compromised in someone's life? Uh, so you know, even if the the uh, legal charges, let's say, are taking taken off the table, if let's say marijuana is decriminalized or or whatever, uh, there are still going to be legal ramifications for let's say driving under the influence, as we have with alcohol. Someone's functioning is still going to be limited. Their ability to uh, engage with, with their uh, family and loved ones and achieve a quality of life uh, uh, to their fullest potential could potentially be compromised by a use disorder. And so, uh, and certainly with alcohol, the interaction with other medical conditions can't be understated as Dr. Ryan has already talked to us about. And so, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, the acceptability of alcohol use on a societal level, a little bit above our pay grade, I think, <laughs> on some level, but you know, probably more important for us to think about, like, what is lost, what is compromised when someone engages, uh, you know, in, in an escalating amount of alcohol use, and then, you know, ultimately develops uh, the brain disorder, which which we call alcohol use disorder. Um, I, it, we've got a, maybe one or two minutes left for question and answer. So we did receive a handful of questions during the registration. I'm just going to peel off one or two really quick, and then... Um, uh, we'll go from there. So Dr. Ryan, if you want to take this one, are there instances when it's better to treat SUD before mental health, mental health before SUD or concurrently? Since you referenced this briefly, uh, if you want to expand on that one just a little bit, I think people would appreciate it. Sure. I think the way that I think about it and most of our uh, providers think about it is what's the critical issue? Uh, so if someone does have a substantial mental health condition regardless of this bipolar or whatnot, um, if they're actively using injunction fentanyl, I really need to stop that as immediately as possible. That being said, that co-assessment needs to occur because very quickly, if I can pause, push the pause button or even quasi pause button on that, uh, we need to understand because uh, how are they going to quickly go back to that use depending on what factors are related to the mental health or the case. And so um, it's that's why there's a board certification in addiction and addiction psychiatry and whatnot. It's not a, it's not a binary. It's not a pretty, it's not an easy chicken and egg. It's more like, uh, you know, kind of a, a continuum. And so I think addressing the most critical thing first, but quickly, very quickly assessing and understanding what contributing factors the other part uh, may be to the issue. And then also being willing to work across time. Really good question, by the way. I've got one other question here I'm going to take before we run into the end of our time together. So how do you all currently coordinate care between multiple sectors to support the needs of your clients? I think the way I'll answer that is transparently and intentionally. Uh, so I think one of the things that, that we find historically in addiction treatment or maybe in behavioral health in general is like, man, it's hard to get someone on the phone, Right. Um, some, you know, I used to joke with our psychiatry colleagues that it's like finding a wizard in an ivory tower. Like, how do you get in the building and find the person and talk to them and that kind of thing. And behavioral health shouldn't be delivered that way. Addiction medicine shouldn't be delivered that way. Again, we don't expect that type of, uh, black box approach in other areas of healthcare. Yes, of course we have privacy and, uh, SUD treatment is held to a, a higher standard as I think many of you are aware of. However, there are ways that we can functionally get around that. We can have part two compliant releases of information. We can ensure that those are available on our website as they are on the Brightview site. We can ensure that reporting to our justice system partners is comprehensive, includes the data that they want and is sent on a repeatable, we use biweekly uh, cadence so that people know exactly when they're going to expect reporting and information if they're an external stakeholder, whether they're a healthcare partner, a justice system partner, or someone in the patient's family who the patient is authorized to receive that information, if it's their primary care provider, et cetera. So thoughtfully, intentionally, I think, ensuring that, uh, uh, that we are uh, aware that we're part of a broader system of care and stakeholders uh, and brings addiction treatment into the light as opposed to uh, you know, being offered uh, you know, in an unknown uh, or, or an inaccessible place. So yeah, great question. And I think one that, that we continue to work to uh, to, to change the existing paradigms around. So uh, we are right at our time. I think if we go to the next slide, we've got some contact information and, and other um, uh, presentations that we'll be doing. So we're very fortunate at Brightview to have a number of folks who are, uh, uh, who are subject matter experts and knowledgeable and, and 
frankly, better presenters than Dr. Ryan and myself. And so I think uh, if, if you all have time to, to join uh, a few of our others, uh, Dr. Anderson uh, and Kelly Offer, they'll be talking about the unique challenges for women in recovery and Rhonda Roper, our VP of Clinical Services in Kentucky and, and Dr. Um, uh, Stanford, or, her name is incorrect here, but Dr. Stanford is our triple boarded psychiatry medical director. Uh, they'll be talking about uh, a, a little bit of the question that we just touched on in, in greater depth. So please, uh, please make some time to join us. And uh, again, if you haven't put your contact information in, throw it in the chat. Uh, we very much appreciate you all making so much time for us today. Uh, our contact information is on the first slide if you want to ever reach out to myself or Dr. Ryan, and we look forward to collaborating with you all in the future. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, folks.